This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to the last lecture of our medical uh, detective series, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tomas Aragon, who's here to speak to us tonight. Dr. Aragon is actually the health officer of the city and county of San Francisco. As a health officer, he actually is a leader in legal authority on how to protect and improve health and health equities. He's also the director of the Population Health Division at the San Francisco Department of Public Health. He's also a faculty member at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, where he teaches epidemiological computing. He's a fellow in the California Healthcare Foundation Leadership Program as well, which I'll talk a little bit uh, more in, 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 in forward going. And has, has, has his own blog, actually, I don't know if many of you picked up on that on his uh, bio, called medepi.com, where you can find information on topics ranging from everything from quality improvement, medical ethics, um, information technology, healthy eating and active living, just to name a few. Dr. Aragon actually got his BA right here at UC Berkeley in molecular biology. He then went to the other coast uh, to Harvard Medical School and got his medical degree. This was followed by getting an MPH in epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. He then got a doctor in public health degree, also in epidemiology, right here at the UC, uh, UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Dr. Aragon also did his residency in primary care right here at UCSF. This was followed by a fellowship in infectious diseases at UCSF as well, followed by a postdoc research fellowship at the UCSF Center for AIDS Prevention Studies. And as mentioned above, Dr. Aragon is also currently a fellow at the California Healthcare Foundation doing a fellowship in healthcare leadership. Some of the awards uh, that he's received, only a few that I'm going to be mentioning, he had received an award in academic achievement and community service from both UC Berkeley and Harvard Medical School. He also got an award in the recognition of outstanding contribution in the field of epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health. And he's also been awarded a very prestigious Crevins Award that was awarded during his residency at San Francisco General Hospital, which recognizes outstanding physicians and excellence in patient care professional conduct, compassion for patients, and outstanding interaction with levels of all staff. And his other activities, just to close things up, include him being an expert consultant to the CDC, as well as having sat on committees that advised the director of the CDC and the federal government regarding issues surrounding national biosurveillance. He's also served as a committee member at the Institute of Medicine, which is an independent nonprofit organization that works to give unbiased and authoritative advice to a lot of healthcare leaders as well as to the public. So here we have it, folks. In our closing to the Medical Detective series, we have a speaker who incorporates the heart of a physician, the mind of a scientist, and the spirit of a healthcare leader and advocate who works tirelessly to protect all of us. So Dr. Aragon is here to talk to us today about public health outbreaks. OK, I'm going to let her introduce every time I talk. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to come and speak. Uh, so what I'm going to talk today about, I'm going to talk about outbreaks. And the genesis of this talk uh, was back around 2000, maybe, yeah, around 2003. This was when we were concerned about smallpox potentially being released at the time that we were, there was a concern around uh, bioterrorism and the things going on in Iraq. And somebody at the State Health Department asked me to put together a 30-minute talk for, public, for public, public health practitioners on how to control a smallpox outbreak. What are the core epidemiologic concepts they needed 
to control a smallpox outbreak. And so I thought, oh my God, how am I going to teach epidemiology in 30 minutes? And so it forced me to really think about what key concepts would I want to impart to folks around, around outbreaks, something that, could, that was really could be life-threatening. And so, and that's what I'm going to try. And that's what I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to cover. And so, and the good thing about these concepts is that you don't have to be a physician, you don't have to have a, a PhD. Um, basically, what you need is common sense. Most of the stuff is common sense. When we think about outbreaks, outbreaks occur in the community, and common sense goes a long way. When you're in a hospital, you have negative pressure rooms, personal protective equipment. You have all this. You have all these environmental and engineering things to help protect you. But when you're in the community, all you have, like I said, is common sense. So uh, that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to um, impart with you, with you guys. <clears throat> and I'm gonna, I'm, gonna cover, I'm gonna cover some concepts for controlling outbreaks. I'm gonna tell you really briefly summarize how we investigate outbreaks. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna go through a few, a few outbreaks. And if, you, if you've been following the news, you, there's, there's outbreaks we're coming out in the news all the time. I won't mention any of the, any of the recent companies that have been mentioned in the news, uh, but one of them sells chicken, and another one sells, sells salads. And so that's, an example, that's just one example of the kinds of things you're, you're hearing about. OK. How many people saw the movie Contagion? OK. If you haven't seen the movie Contagion, Go rent the movie and watch it. It's actually a very good movie. And they had really top-notch public health and medical experts consulting on the movie to make it as realistic as you can within the constraints of Hollywood and, it, and, it's, you know, and its need to exaggerate. But you actually learn, you actually learn quite a bit from, from the movie, both how the CDC works, public health and investigations, how a pandemic can arise and really spread throughout the world. <clears throat> if you see there, right there is Lawrence Fishburne. In the movie, Lawrence Fishburne is the head of the CDC, okay? That's my role in San Francisco. I'm the head, of the, the, the local equivalent of the head of the CDC for San Francisco. And, and that's at the Department of Public Health. <clears throat> so we're going to just cover a few, a few definitions. So what is a cluster? Sometimes you'll hear people talking about clusters. So a cluster is when you observe an increase in the number of cases of anything. OK, it's just observed. It, the, the, the cases can be clustering by space or, or by time. And when you have clustering, people start wondering, is there an outbreak? Sometimes you'll hear people talk about cancer clusters, for example. And part of our challenge is to then distinguish, is this just statistical variation? Or do we really have an increase in, from what we would expect? So if we do have, if we do have an increase in the number of cases, then, that, then we would expect for that time or place, we call that an outbreak. If we have a sustained outbreak that's really involving a larger region, we'll tend to call that an epidemic. But some people would sometimes use the, the word epidemic and outbreak interchangeably. And a pandemic is a global epidemic. So HIV is an example of a pandemic. In, in 2009, we had a pandemic of influenza, the H1N1 influenza. Now, here is another well-established cause of an outbreak. Over, over here, what you see is you see a person with a rash, and you see a reporter, OK? So before I go to the other ones, I remember a few years ago, I got, I got invited to our board of supervisors because we had, we had some cases of meningeal cockal disease, meningeal cockal meningitis in San Francisco. And they came, they asked me, they asked me to come and speak to them about the, the outbreak of meningeal cockal disease we were having in San Francisco. And so I brought and I showed them, I showed them a graph of the amount of meningeal cockal disease we have in San Francisco and that it hasn't increased. But then I showed a graph of the number of stories that were written about the number of meningeal cockle diseases. And what you saw was basically an epidemic of stories. <laughs> OK, so this is also an example of really part of some, some, sometimes things are driven by our perceptions and news stories. 
And this becomes important, for example, um, we're going to be entering influenza season, and oftentimes people don't want to get they don't want to get uh, vaccinated against influenza. But influenza makes people can make people sick, and some people die, including children. And if you just you just have a few cases, and people think we have a we think we might have a severe flu season, all of a sudden in people's minds they want to become vaccinated. So you see a lot of stories, and then all of a sudden people want to become want to become vaccinated. Okay. So I just wanted to point that out. I also thought it was a cute cartoon. Okay, so then what do we, sometimes how do we respond? Okay, so here's an example. Mom, none of the other kids wear this at school. So then we have our, we have our reaction. And I will, I will show, by the end of the talk, will you, hopefully you will know enough that if you do decide to put your kid in that type of personal protective equipment, at least you'll know why, okay? So why do we investigate outbreaks? We investigate outbreaks to prevent additional cases in the current outbreak. We investigate them to prevent future outbreaks, to learn something, to learn about new diseases, or sometimes to learn something new about an old disease. And influenza is a great example. Influenza is an old disease, but we continue to have, we continue, continue to have outbreaks. We investigate to reassure the public to minimize economic and social disruption, and we also investigate to teach other investigators how to, do, how to do science. One of the great things about investigating outbreaks is that you get to practice the scientific method in a very short timeline. Many research projects take months to design and years to complete. In an outbreak investigation, in a matter of a couple of weeks, you go through all the steps of the scientific method, including developing hypothesis, developing instruments to collect data, uh, testing the hypothesis and then drawing causal inferences. So in epidemiology is a, is a great tool to really get to the core of the scientific method. <clears throat> so I'm going to cover, before I get into the outbreaks, three different areas. I'm going to go, I'm going to not go too fast, um, but it's, it, it may seem a little complicated, but it's all common sense, and hopefully, hopefully you'll, stay, you'll stay with me. And I, I've given this for many years, so hopefully I've sort of figured out how to, how to get this across to folks. We're gonna talk about transmission mechanisms. We're gonna cover primarily the first two models. One is what's called the chain model of infectious diseases. The second one is called the natural history of infection and infectiousness. I'm gonna briefly just introduce a convergence model and you'll see that all of this is common sense. Then I'll get a little technical. I will get a little, is any, I don't know, has anybody ever heard of the reproductive number? Anybody? Okay. In fertility, we have a reproductive number. In order to survive as a species, we have to produce at least one other person on average, right? That's all the reproductive number is. In an, an outbreak, an organism to survive in a population where it's spreading, it just has to produce one other infectious case. That's the reproductive number. It's a little bit of demography, but I'm going to show you. Um, if you see the movie Contagion, you'll see you'll 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 see um, a discussion of the number, the reproductive the reproductive number, because it's actually important to understand the dynamics of transmission. And then I'll cover a couple of other things, and I'll show you. I'll show you. Then we we look at this in a very holistic way. You will have you will have on one piece of you'll have. Literally, in just a few points, all the concepts you need to control any epidemic that's transmitted person to person. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just start with a chain model. And the chain model is very intuitive. Okay. And I actually like this this bifocal model. One is because it looks like a bifocal, and the other one is so it reminds you that there's always two things for us to think about. Where is the microbe coming from, and where is it going? So we always have this, these two things to think about. On the left-hand side, we see, you see the word microbial agent. It could be a virus, a bacterium, a fungus. Is in a reservoir or source. What is a reservoir? A reservoir is the natural habitat of that organism where you would normally find it, okay? So recently in San Francisco, we had an outbreak of E. coli 
um, yeah, we had an outbreak of hemorrhagic E. coli. We call it O57H7, O157H7. Normally, where you find that E. coli, you find it in cattle. You'll find it in other animals, but primarily in, in cattle. So that cattle is the reservoir, OK? But how does that usually get to us? It usually gets to us through a source. And that source is food or water or often uh, basically food and water. And so for example, ground beef that is undercooked, because beef can become con ground beef can become contaminated, right? When it's, the beef is undercooked, that's one of the ways that we can get E. coli. We can get it from salads or, 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 or things that aren't, for, aren't heated and we know the bacteria are not killed. So for example, the recent outbreak that we had associated with salads, OK? So the reservoir is where it normally is. The source it w is where it is right before it's transmitted to a susceptible host. OK, and that's the one we're usually concerned about us. From the reservoir or source, you have a portal of exit. OK, so it can come out of the gastrointestinal tract. It can come from the respiratory tract. OK, we have a mode of transmission. How does it get from the reservoir or source to the susceptible host? And we'll cover that. And then you have a portal of entry. Does it come in through the skin, through a mucous membrane, for example? Do, do, you, do you breathe it in? A, a reservoir, a reservoir can be a source, but not all sources are reservoirs. OK, and we'll go through that in a second. So this is called, this is, again, very intuitive, six components called the chain model of infectious diseases. All components have to exist. All components have to be linked together for infection to occur. That's why we call it the chain model, OK? And then, I, and then of course, the susceptible hosts, OK? So reservoirs, in general, we think of three reservoirs humans, animals, or the environment, OK? I just mentioned a little while ago about E. coli O157, where that comes usually from cattle, OK? There are some, there are some diseases where humans are the only reservoir. Most of our vaccine-preventable diseases, humans are the only reservoir, OK? Measles, mumps, rubella, OK? Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. A lot of the conditions where uh, a lot of some of whom, most of the ones I mentioned have a vaccine are humans are the only reservoir. The significance of a bacteria where uh, an agent where humans are the only reservoir is that in theory we can eradicate it from the human species. And the only example that we've seen to date is smallpox. That's one of the reasons why smallpox was eradicated from the human species, because humans were the only reservoir. The, 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 the virus that we're now trying to eradicate from the world is poliovirus. Okay? So once poliovirus is eradicated, it's no longer going to exist in the human species. And then the environment. Okay? Occasionally, you'll hear people getting Legionella, sometimes in hospitals. Um, and so we have, we have, uh, we have uh, bacterium that you can find in the, in the environment. Modes of transmission. OK. Contact. So direct contact. Sexually transmitted diseases is through direct contact. Indirect contact is when you touch something that's contaminated. OK, so some people will think about doorknobs, for example, pens, anything that's contaminated. The next, major, the next major category is respiratory droplets. So when I cough, sneeze, or talk, sometimes you will see droplets come out that quickly settle to the ground. A lot of the agents that we tend to worry about when we were worrying about sort of the worst things that can happen, things like smallpox, pandemic influenza, um, are transmitted by large respiratory droplets. Why is that important? Well, because 
those droplets quickly settle, which means that you have to be close to somebody and have face-to-face -face contact with them to become infected. Or you have to touch a surface that's been infected. And that's one of the reasons why hand washing is very important, because we can touch, we can touch surfaces. How often do you think that we touch our face? At least, probably at least 200 times a day. That's how often we're touching our face. Okay, so we, we talk not just about hand, aware, hand hygiene, but also hand awareness. Okay, but but the environment can become true. The environment can become uh, contaminated because of large respiratory droplets. The other reason why that's in, the other thing that's important is that so protection is relatively simple. Okay, protection is relatively simple. Okay. And we're going to go through that in a little, in a, a, a little. Actually, we'll just say it right now. So, for me, for example, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I, I mentioned that smallpox is spread through large respiratory droplets. So this was now in. I can't remember exactly. I think it was back. I, I think it was beginning really early in 2003. This is when we were concerned that Iraq might have smallpox. And I got called by an internist. At that time, I was in charge of communicable disease. I don't know, is that, do you have your hand up? Is there, was there a question? Um, there was, um, I got called by an internist who had seen, who had seen, who just saw a patient who had just flew in from Australia. Okay. And this internist, this internist saw this rash, this pustular rash that he had never seen before. So he sent this person immediately, sent this person immediately to the dermatologist. I got a call by the dermatologist. This was now, yeah, this was been in February of 2003. And the dermatologist says to me, I think I have a case of smallpox. And my heart just dropped because I'm, I'm thinking, oh my God, right now smallpox doesn't exist in the world. This person just came from an airline. And, and I have a dermatologist who should know, if anybody should know smallpox, it should be a dermatologist, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm going over there and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and... Um, uh, I'm going to go see this. I'm going to go see this patient, and so naturally, I'm thinking, okay, how am I going to protect myself? Okay, so let's just th think about it. if I said it was primarily through respiratory droplets, how would you protect yourself if you if you were going to see somebody who had a deadly infectious disease that was spread by respiratory droplets? You'd put some type of barrier protection on you, right, to protect your mucous membranes, portal of entry, have good hand hygiene and good good awareness. Okay. And so there, there are some common sense things that you would do. And of course, I'm thinking through my mind all the common sense things. And actually, one of the, things, one of the common sense things we did, remember I told you that distance is important? How do you think, how do you think I interviewed her? I called her. <laughs> I picked up the telephone. I remember I said common sense. If this person really has a deadly disease, the best thing to do is why do I even want to go and if I don't need to, I can just, we called her up and we just interviewed her by the telephone and then we went in, we put in personal protective equipment, we went beyond the simple, we sort of assumed, we're, I'm going to get to airborne in a second, but we went, we went beyond assuming that it might be more than droplet uh, with something that's, that's, that is potentially that, that deadly. Um, but anyway, we, we basically use common sense. Get as much information as you can by phone, go in there, Physical exam, collect some specimens, get out of there. Okay, make sure she didn't require uh, immediate medical care. Turned out not to be smallpox because if it was, we'd all we, we'd all know by now. Okay. So so droplets are are important because they're really common common sense basic things that you can do. Airborne is different. Airborne is when the microbe becomes airborne. It's very very tiny, becomes airborne, and can last in the air for a long period of time. Okay so that you can breathe it deep into your lung. It can move, it can move to different parts of the, it can move to different parts of the room. Okay? So now it's, now the concept is different. Okay? Now we're talking about a different concept. Okay? We're not talking about a large droplet that settles, but something that remains in the air for a longer period of time. So the basic concept is, is that we want to dilute the air and filter the air. That's it. So if you were walking into a place where somebody had somebody had an air an airborne disease, you might open the window, right? You might open the window. You might put a special mask on that filters the air. Okay, and you're, you're going to see that in a second. So, 
And sometimes when you go to, when you go into the hardware store, you'll see these dust masks, these dust masks that fit tightly on your face. That's called that, that's actually called a respirator. Okay, it may look like a regular face mask, but it's called a respirator because it's supposed to fit tight, tight in your face, so you can generate negative pressure and filter air that you breathe. So it's a different it's a different concept, but you can use some practical things to do some practical things. So when the SARS outbreak occurred back in 2003, and when they, when they were putting up these makeshift hospitals, they would make sure that the, the, every, the place was well ventilated. They'd open the windows, okay? Airborne. Things that are airborne, chicken pox, uh, measles, tuberculosis, sometimes influenza can become airborne. Vehicle-borne means that it gets in through you through ingestion, instrumentation, or injection. So food and water is an example of uh, uh, vehicle-borne. Vector-borne, mosquitoes, okay, ticks, and then of course vertical transmission from mother to child. Okay, so those are the only, those are really, that's how, that's how diseases are, are transmitted. The reason why we have to go over this is that when you investigate an outbreak, when you investigate an outbreak, you're thinking about, you're, remember, you're trying to, you're, gonna, you're, you're investigating an outbreak because you're trying to understand what's going on. And so, like fixing a car, before you can fix a car, you have to know how it works. So right now, as we're learning about the population ecology of infectious disease transmission, so that when we begin to look at outbreaks, we understand what the investigators are trying to, trying to get at, okay? Oh, fomites are inanimate objects. Inanimate objects. Pens, for example, are, are fomites. So that's, that's jargon. Yeah, it, it sounds like it sounds like something, something that crawls, right? But it's it's actually inanimate objects. I should probably change that. <clears throat> okay. The other reason why I put the first three together is that if you were to go into a hospital and talk to the infection infection control professionals you will hear them talking about contact precautions, droplet precautions, or airborne precautions, okay? And pretty much, you guys will know what they're talking about, okay? When they talk about droplet precautions, they're taking common sense measures to prevent the transmission of things that are normally sped by droplets. Air, airborne, taking, taking steps. And usually, I mentioned earlier, they use engine, engineering methods like negative pressure rooms, et cetera. But it gives you an idea. Those are, this is part of uh, infection control. OK. Portals of exit and portals of entry. Pretty self-explanatory, not rocket science. We'll just, we'll just move on from there. OK. What I want to do right now is, just for, just for uh, a few minutes, is just take you through this one-page handout. So my goal today is, my goal today is, it's call, I, I call it here the PhD for Population Health Division Model of Infectious Disease Transmission, is to make sure that you look at this handout and you understand it, okay? We developed this handout years ago to help anybody really, really to think about infectious diseases after disasters. Okay, and so if you understand this, then you'll then it'll help you understand out, outbreaks. It'll help you understand outbreak investigations. If you see at the top, you'll see you'll see four words that are blue. You see something. Okay. <clears throat> Somewhere, somehow, some. I'll just read. I'll say though, something from somewhere somehow gets into someone. This is the chain model that I just explained. Something, a microbial agent, somehow, from somewhere, a reservoir or source, somehow, mode of transmission gets into someone, a susceptible host, okay? Those are the four key things and the six components of the chain model that help the framework to hang everything else, okay, for, for infectious diseases. Next thing is under the somewhere, you'll see reservoir and sources. You'll see a listing of things. They're listed in a very intentional way, okay? Air, water, food, people, animals and vectors, vehicles, soil and debris. The reason why they're entered in this way is because after a disaster, for example, we have no choice but to breathe, okay? 
So if something's in the air, you know what? You're going to get it because you have no choice unless you knew ahead of time that you, you, needed, you needed to somehow filter the air. Um, so uh, back at the Northridge earthquake, when, when uh, soil was disrupt disrupted, people came down with valley fever because dust was kicked up and they breathed it in. You have no choice. You got to breathe. Guess what? You have to drink water. Water is really important, not just, for, not just because you have to drink it, but you also use it for hygiene, for sanitation purposes, for washing. You got to eat food. You got to be around people. Okay, so there's a hierarchy of things that you're going to get exposed to. The idea was here is that right after a disaster and you're trying to prevent an outbreak, you'll start with those things that, you'll start with those things that, okay, is there anything in the air that we might get exposed to? Because we know that we have no choice, but we have to breathe. Water, we have to make sure that the water is safe, et cetera. So it gives you a hierarchy to think, think, think about. Under mode of transmission, we just covered the six components, okay? Under, under susceptible host, under susceptible host, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you uh, seven things to think about. Okay, these are called the seven habits of uninfected people. Okay, the seven habits of uninfected people. And basically, the way we came up with these seven habits, when I used to go around and give talks, I'd ask people to give me the four, the four core things that they would do to prevent transmission of infectious diseases, and we got them down to seven. Safe consumption, okay? You see food and water, personal hygiene, covering your cough, right? And you don't cough into your hands. Never cough into your hands. You cough into your sleeves, right? Everybody knows that. You will see many doctors cough into their hands, okay? I saw one yesterday cough into their hands. Get vaccinated. Use protection. I, we put protection in quotes because it depends on who the audience is. Okay, If you're speaking to some adolescents who are sexually active, protection means something different. If you're speaking to an infection co control practitioner, protection might mean a face mask. Reducing special risk. So if somebody's immune compromised because of HIV or chemotherapy, and then basic infection control. And I just already mentioned the basic infection control. That just comes out of the concepts of of how things are transmitted. So this is, this is our model, infectious disease transmission. So as, as we go through, as, we, as I go through everything, every, you know, everything that I'm going to cover, it all comes back to this. Okay? Why did I put this together? When I was an infectious disease fellow, do you think I was taught this? I, I know I'm being taped, but no, I was not taught this. <laughs> I was taught how to diagnose and treat patients with, with antibiotics to really sort of cure, to help cure individual patients, okay? In public health, it's about eliminating transmission. Outbreaks is about transmission, okay? That's what outbreaks is about. In public health, we focus on eliminating transmission to preventing new cases. So that means what we're really talking about is population ecology. It's not just diagnosis and treatment. Diagnosis and treatment is important because you want to make somebody non-infectious, right? Everybody, everybody with me so far, okay? Okay. <clears throat> Good infection control starts with common sense. I didn't mention this, but how about covering the source? How about covering the portal of exit? Okay? Does that make, does that, do people feel like that's common sense to do, to cover the portal of exit? Okay. I'm going to show, I'm now going to read to you from a news story that happened a few years ago regarding SARS. Okay, SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, when it first happened back in March of 2003, scared the living daylights, daylights out of us in public health. Imagine an infectious disease that spread like the common cold, okay? No treatment, no vaccine, had a death rate of 11% overall, and a death rate of 50% in those greater than 50. We were scared. It was the scariest four months that I've ever experienced. Think about that. 11% death rate overall, 50% death rate in people over 50. The 1918 pan pandemic influenza, the worst influenza pandemic that man has seen, 
had a mortality rate of about 2%. Okay, this was more than five times that. Okay, so all of us were scared. Okay, now let's just see if common sense wins the day. <clears throat> Disease care at San Jose Airport, five on flight from Asia examined, none found with SARS. In a false alarm heard round the world, the Santa Clara County Health System jumped into high alert Tuesday morning when an American Airlines flight from Tokyo radioed that it might have five cases of the mysterious flu-like illness known as SARS on board. Joan Chrisman said she had no hard feelings about being treated as a potential health threat. The couple had just completed an exhausting month-long journey that included stops in Vietnam, Thailand, Hong Kong, three Southeast Asian hotspot spots for SARS. There were four fire trucks and eight police cars and four or five ambulances, she recalled. I couldn't believe it. I thought, wow, what's going on here? Little did I know that we were to be the victims. The couple were asked twice to go to Valley Medical Center and twice they politely declined. And then Crispin said, they soon opened up the ambulance doors and said, sorry, we're taking you to the hospital. At the hospital, according to Crispin, we were the only ones not wearing masks. Okay, so here we were, we had that the most highly trained medical and public health professionals and EMS professionals seeing somebody who potentially had the worst infectious disease that we have ever seen and they did not cover, cover the portal of exit, okay? So what am I saying is that what is what you might what you what I'm telling you is common sense. Put a mask on somebody, even the most highly trained people don't practice common sense. Okay, everybody, everybody understand that. So you, it, so I want to point out is that you can if, if you you can help us out. You can help you can help the professionals out. When word got out just who they were, she said, people started running like crazy like we were the bubonic plague. They put us in a room full of people with plastic boots, face shields, and masks, okay? And, and you know, and I, and I, you know, when I read this, I said, wow. I said, how, how, can, this, how can this happen? And it's because, it's because the emphasis, the, you know, the, there's slightly a different emphasis. They don't, they, there's less emphasis on some of these core concepts. I, I said to you as an ID fellow, infectious disease fellow, there wasn't an emphasis on, on this. There was an em emphasis on, diagnosing and, and, you know, doing the right antibiotics, selecting the right combination of antibiotics, managing the levels, getting people, getting their, getting their disease cured. But in public health, outbreaks is about understanding transmission and interrupting it. So the, and so all these concepts are just common sense, they're core concepts. So here's a nurse, here's a nurse, this is, this is during SARS, here's a nurse wearing a 95 respirator. Remember I told you, a respirator, it looks like a face mask, but it's really designed to be tight around your face. I, I like, one of the reasons I like this is that I see, okay, she's wearing an N95, but you know, are those glasses, are there, are that, is that the best protection for her? I remember, this is the most deadliest disease. And then if you look, if you look in the door, it's interesting because you see, you see four signs. It gives you an idea that the usual stop, don't come in, doesn't work. So one sign says stop. The next sign says both doors, um, both doors must be kept closed at all times. No visitors allowed with an exclamation mark. Strict, strict isolation at all times, okay? So people were saying this, this SARS infection is much, much worse. Please do not come in here. And so people had to practice, begin to practice good infection control. <clears throat> so why, why are we covering this? Because as I showed you in that cartoon, if you don't understand basic concepts, guess what? You're gonna do, you're gonna, you're gonna do what you think makes sense to you. And you may not have the right concept, okay? So this is an example, these are, these are, these are uh, this is during SARS during the SARS outbreak, this is in Hong Kong, and you can see two, two uh, citizens here in Hong Kong, and they're taking, they're taking their own infection control uh, intervention. 
On the left-hand side, you see a woman who's wearing a surgical mask and a bag, a plastic bag over her face, okay? So we might say, hmm, okay, well, maybe that might work, okay? But probably overkill, but it might work. We see another gentleman there who has a bag over his whole trunk, okay? So the idea here is that when you do not have basic concepts, you take measures into your own hands. And when we talk to the public health, when we're training public health practitioners, we tell them, look, you guys, you guys have to know these concepts, okay? You guys have to be the experts. You have to get good information out there because the lay, lay people may not get it right. And as I just showed you, even medically trained people may not get it right, okay? So you have to sort of really understand how transmission occurs. He's walking in front of the Amoy Gardens. In the Amoy, in the, in the Amoy Gardens, when SARS happened, SARS was also a good percentage of patients would get, um, it was a respiratory disease, they'd get a really bad, severe pneumonia, but some of them would actually get a bad diarrhea. The, the um, virus was excreted in the stool. Okay, we had one, one gentleman with, a bad, with SARS, with diarrhea, used a restroom in the Amoy Gardens, and because of the way the buildings and the plumbing systems are designed in Hong Kong, it became aerosolized throughout the building, and from that one case, 300, over 350 cases of SARS from one person using the bathroom, okay? And it has to do with the way the, way, um, the plumbing system in Hong Kong works. It has to do with the way the British would build uh, bathrooms and the way they would they would hose them down. They they would they would have the bathroom the in the in the bathroom you have what would happen is that you would hose down the bathroom and you'd have the the drain would have a, a sort of like a U hook like this and then it would go to where the the sewage system is where the toilet is also connected, but that that um, that hook right here that U hook was supposed to be filled with water. So if you weren't filling it with water. It actually, it actually was connecting air through air. And what would happen is, is that this person with diarrhea got into the sewage system, came back up, then came into the building, and then through negative pressure, just spread throughout the whole building. So it's very, very, if you think about it, it's very, what, what that, think, about what, think about what that means. That means. That means that these buildings with these types of plumbing systems Fecal material is being spread all the time, but you don't have outbreaks because people are immune. Does that make sense? Right? People, people aren't hosing. It's modern days, people just mop. <laughs> they, don't, they don't hose down. And so this is sort of an example where I'm talking about the population ecology. We never would have thought that this was happening. But when you introduce a novel agent, all of a sudden a new mode of transmission became apparent to us. Okay. Everybody understand what I'm saying? A, a, new, a new agent was introduced into the population, and all of a sudden you realize that this, was, this is probably happening in all the buildings. It's just that people are immune to the things that, that people are carrying. So here's a patient during the SARS outbreak. What, she's wearing a lot of personal protective equipment. What is she being protected from? Is she being protected from herself? The answer is no. She's not being protected from herself. So she was in, in an infectious disease hospital. So an infectious disease So even in an infectious disease hospital, they didn't really understand the concepts of transmission. Because you, you, a healthcare worker might dress that way to protect themselves, but you're not protecting her from a disease that she already has, okay? So the concepts I'm showing you are all common sense, and I want you to, to realize that you can, that, that you can, you can understand them, uh, but not everybody does understand them. But they're not, they're not difficult to understand. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Okay, one question, go ahead. Um, by putting the, the uh, outfit on the Indian woman, does that protect others? Yeah, it could. It, it, so think about. So think about if you were going to protect others, the only thing you would really want to do is just cover her mouth. Really, that's really it. And, and if she had diarrhea, you'd want to take what they call contract precautions, which is be careful with the stool and washing your hands. Okay. So there's simple things that you would do if you, if you wanted to, you know, uh, but not but not all that. There's sort of over is overkill. It's overkill. 
But I want you to realize that the, the, concepts, the, con the concepts are common sense. To take nothing but common sense. And you can, implement, you can implement common sense concepts tomorrow. Tonight, you can implement. The other, one, the, other, the other important concept that I want to cover is that when you go see a doctor, okay, when you go see a doctor, the doctor is usually interested in, sometimes the doctor is interested in the incubation period. Most people have heard of the incubation period. It's from the time you got infected until you become sick, okay? The time you become infected until the time you become sick. In public health, we're interested in the incubation period, but we're also interested in something else. We're interested in what's called the latent period. I'm interested also from the time you became infected to the time you become infectious to other people. The time you're infected to the time you become infectious. Okay. Let's look at, let's look at the first, the first uh, slide, the first uh, diagram up here, diagram A. I see that the incubation period is shorter than the latent period. That means that somebody's going to develop symptoms before they become infectious. Okay, they're gonna, and it turned out that this was actually true for um, uh, SARS. People became symptomatic before they became infectious. That's good for us for public health because it makes it easier for us to identify who needs to be isolated to decrease transmission. What's the opposite? The opposite is, is that the incubation period is longer than the latent period, which means that they become infectious before they have any symptoms. Can, can anybody think of right now we're in a pandemic where people are infectious for a long period of time before they become symptomatic. Does anybody know? HIV. HIV. Okay. HIV. This is one of the reasons why, we, why it, spread, it spread dramatically is because people did not have symptoms. Chronic hepatitis B. Chronic hepatitis C. Okay. Hepatitis A is another one that we deal with in public health. In public health, you're infectious for a whole week before you develop any symptoms of hepatitis A. Okay, so by the time that food handler comes down with food handler becomes sick with hepatitis A, we're worried about the week before when they were preparing people's salads, and hoping that they they had been washing their hands after they used the restroom. Okay, it's important. It's an, I'm bringing this up because it's an important concept, not just for control, but it, it is the driver of some of the big epidemics that we face. Okay, these epidemics. Was there? Go ahead. Yeah, can one uh, fortify their immune system to become uh, to be, be, uh, not worried about catching these infections? Or <laughs> well, so for those for those conditions that are vaccine preventable, there's a basically two uh, for. There's two ways. There's there's two ways. There's two ways you can become immunized. There's two ways you can become immunized. One is through natural infection. Okay, or through vaccination. Okay, sometimes natural infection, actually, usually natural infection can be can be more deadly than vaccination. So oftentimes we 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 tell people it's better to get vaccinated than it is through natural natural uh, natural infection, and that's the reason why people become vaccinated because they would rather they'd rather get immunity through vaccination rather than natural infection because the disease can be deadly. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, the question was about, well, the question was about can people, what can people do to increase their immunity? Increase their immunity. And basically, those are, those are the, the, the two choices. It's, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting question because I have three kids. They're all, you know, they're 17, 16, and 12. But, you know, when you're young, when the kids are really young, you become concerned about what they're going to get exposed to. And, and the, one of the things for, uh, for, it's just true for humans is that, Getting exposed to infections is natural. It's actually part of developing our immune system, is getting exposed to infections, right? So when kids are really young, I mean really young, they're getting like 12 respiratory tract infections a year, 
okay? They're just getting a whole bunch. Their noses are always running, and that's just normal, right? And they're, they're basically, they're getting exposed to all the things they're supposed to get exposed. They're building natural, they're building natural immunity. And so in general, that, that's why people used to, like, when my, my kids would come home, I would, you know, hug them and kiss them just as much. I didn't care if they had a runny nose or not, okay? So I didn't treat them any different just because they were sick. But with the exception of a few conditions, there's a few conditions where I don't want them to get those things because I know it can make them really sick. And so that's where vaccines come in. And so there's always this, there's always, I bring this up because there's always this, tra there's always this trade off. Yes, it's natural for us to get exposed to infectious agents as part of us. It's part of us as being part of the human population. But there's a few things you don't want it, you don't want your kids to get, and that's why we vaccinate them. So this is an important, this is an, a, an important concept. Okay. And then the last important concept in terms of mechanisms is just a convergence model. All this says is that a lot of stuff comes together. A lot of stuff comes together to really produce epidemics, okay? And usually it's not just the microbe and it's not just the humans, but it's also the physical and, the physical and environmental factors, ecological factors, social, political, uh, and uh, other, other factors as well, that these all, these really all come together. And we're not going to we're not going to cover more. This is just a re reminder that there's 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 bigger things to think about than the stuff that I'm covering today. Okay. <clears throat> so here here here's an epidemic curve for SARS. Okay. So these are cases of SARS. This is in this is in uh, Singapore. Okay. This is one way that we normally think about looking at an epidemic. We see what people will call this an epidemic curve. Okay. So I'm going to show you another way, another way of thinking about this. You can think of it that way. Okay. I can ask the question, this is where the reproductive number comes in. On average, how many infectious cases does an does a, does a infectious case produce during its infectious period? Okay. So this person here, during their infectious period, Look at all the people that this person infected, okay? But if you, go, if you go down and you look here, this person only infected two, this person infected two, this one infected three. So when you average these out, when you average these out, the average number of secondary cases that were produced by a, a, each individual case was about 3.5 for SARS. It was about 3.5 for SARS. Okay, why is that number? Why is that number important? Because it gives you, in order for an epidemic to occur, in order for an epidemic to occur, you, that number has to be greater than one, because if the number is less than one, the epidemic is going to die out. So our mission in public health is always to reap, is to reduce that reproductive number less than one. That is our that is our mission in public health is to get that number to go less to go less than one. And you do, but you do see that, that variability. And the reason why we're going to focus on the reproductive number for a, sec a second is that it actually introduces us to a few other key concepts that we really need to understand to really control epidemics. I've mentioned the mechanisms. Now we're going to get a little bit into what we, we call dynamics, understanding the force of transmission through a population. But this is this is this is pretty pretty intuitive. You kind of get the idea. It's a different way. It's a different way of looking at the epidemic curve. Okay. So what better person to do it than to have Kate Winslet tell us? <laughs> so in the movie Contagion, she she teaches the reproductive number. In fact, she teaches a special reproductive number. It's called it's called the the basic reproductive number. It's it's a little slightly theoretical. It's it's if you were to take a single case and throw that, a single case of an infectious disease and throw it into a completely susceptible population, no immunity, with no control measures, okay? So that's what it's sort of worst case scenario. On average, how many cases would it produce, okay? I just told you that SARS produced about 3.5 cases. Pandemic influenza back in 19, 1918 was about 1.8, 1.9, not even two, okay? Measles, measles, the basic reproductive number of measles is around 15. 
Okay, measles, super infectious, super infectious. So you get, it gives you an idea of the, how infectious different agents are. So, and so, and I was fortunate enough to find, so here she says flu one and smallpox three. Actually, it's a normal flu, and I just told you that in the pandemic it went close to, close to two. And so I found a nice, I found a nice slide I found an L slide in the, that had, actually had three and actually had one. But you kind of get you you kind of you you get you get the idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to break down those those components. And if you watch the movie, you you can review you can review the concepts by watching the movie. Actually, you guys will really enjoy the movie when you watch it now because you'll you'll we're going to take our bifocals and we're going to think about it we're going to think about it a little bit differently. Okay. Okay, how do we think about the reproductive number? I think about it from the, from the perspective of the microbial agent. I think about it from the perspective of the microbial agent. So I'm gonna put on my cow hat, okay? I'm now the microbe, okay? So I'm the microbe. What do I wanna do, okay? How, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a host that's infected, okay? I'm an infectious, I'm an infectious case. So what do, what do I wanna do? How long am I infectious? How long am I infectious? How much contact am I having with susceptible people? And when I have contact with them, what's the chance that I transmit infection to them? That's from my perspective, okay? How long am I infectious? The duration of infectiousness. How often am I having contact? When I have meaningful contact, what's the chance of transmission occurring? Everybody with me there from the perspective of that, from the microbial, the infectious case? So what we have is we have duration, contact rate, and the probability of transmission, those three things, okay? Duration, contact, probability of transmission, okay? now. I switch hats. I, I don't have a Stanford hat, <laughs> but if I had a Stanford hat, I would put a Stanford hat on, and I say, so I'll do it like this. Okay, imagine I have a Stanford hat on. By the way, it'll be a miracle, but Cal, might, may, they may beat Stanford this weekend, hopefully. <laughs> Probably not, Stanford's got an amazing team. Okay, but from, the, from, the, from a susceptible host perspective, okay, we can, think, we can think of the infection rate. The infection rate among susceptibles. Well, what has to happen for the infection rate among susceptibles? What is the contact rate of that susceptible to somebody who's, who's infectious, potentially infectious? What is the contact rate of somebody who's potentially infectious? The big P is, what is the probability that that person is infectious? What is the big P is, what is the probability that person is infectious? And then the small p again, if they were infectious, what is the probability that they're going to infect me, they're going to transmit to me, okay? I'll give you a concrete example. In San Francisco in the 80s, during the, early on in the AIDS epidemic, the big P, the probability of a gay male, the probability of a gay male being infected with HIV was about 60%, 60%. The contact rate would be unprotected, unprotected sex, and then the probability of transmission actually is relatively, it's actually relatively, it's really small. So you can see the big driver, the big driver of the epidemic, it wasn't the trans, probability of transmission, it's actually very small, but it was how much unprotected sex you had and the probability of a contact being infectious, the big P, okay? So this is, what, this, is, this is what's driving infection among the susceptibles. So you have to attack it from both perspectives, okay? But this should be a little bit, this should be, it should be a little bit, it should be a little bit in, in, intuitive, okay? I know it may not be intuitive the first time you see it, but when you explain it, when I put the, the Cal hat and the Stanford hat, hopefully that helped a little bit. <laughs> okay. For a susceptible person, what is the contact I have with an infectious person? What is the probability that, that that person is infectious? And if they were infectious, what is the probability of them actually transmitting to me? We have everything we need. We have everything we need. 
All we have to do is just, all we have to do is just actually, we only have one more, one more thing to consider. What is the fraction of the population that's susceptible? The fraction of the population that's susceptible. Okay? We have everything we need to control outbreaks. Yeah, uh, does this indicate, say, from the AIDS thing, what one sexual, what's the chance of one sexual exposure causing AIDS? You know, that would be, that would be the small p. That would be the small p. And it turns out to be, oof, depend, depend, depending on the type of sexual activity you would have, but it's, I have, I have, have the numbers in another table. I don't have it with me here. But it's probably going to be like one in 250 or one in 500. It's, it's in, 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 intuitively, it's much smaller, much smaller than you would think through intuition. So the transmission probability for HIV, that's not what was driving the, that was not was driving the epidemic. It was really, it was really the, the, the contact rate, actually the duration of infection, right? Because people are asymptomatic, no symptoms, and infectious for years, having a lot of contact, and then, and then, and then the, the, the proportion of people who are infected going up, and then actually this feedback, this feedback, and then the epidemic would just, would just, would just take off. Fraction of the population that's susceptible. This is, what, this is why we vaccinate people. We vaccinate people to bring, to bring, to reduce the fraction of the population that's susceptible. So basically, you have, you have everything you need to understand how to control an epidemic or an outbreak. This is it. I've just, I've now covered in literally an hour everything that took me almost more than 20 years to learn. <laughs> it all comes down to this. This is it. <laughs> okay? This is it. Reduce the contact rate, right? Makes sense. Reduce the contact rate. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means, reducing the contact rate. Reduce the fraction of the population that's infectious. OK, reduce the population that's infectious. So that means going out and identifying people, isolating them, right? So now, now the people that are circulating, the, the fraction of the people that are infectious goes down. The transmission probability, that small p that I mentioned, is driven by three things. It's actually driven by three things. is how infectious is the source, how susceptible is the host, and is there any physical or chemical factor that can interrupt transmission. OK. So physical and chemical factor. So physical thing might be a face mask, a condom, for example. Okay, so these three, these three are what drive the transmission probability, and then reduces the fraction of the population that's susceptible. Okay, that is it. All, everything that's done to control epidemics is based on these six concepts. That's it. You, you have it all. And the reason why I show this to you, because if you look at the long list of the things that we, we do, you, you'll hear things like, post-exposure prophylaxis, isolation, quarantine. You're all, you, you, there's a long list of things, personal protective equipment, all that infection control stuff. All of them comes down to this, these six factors, okay? Why is this important? Because when a novel agent gets introduced into the population the way SARS was introduced, this is all you have. There was no vaccine. Okay, there was no cure. So we actually go back to just core, core public health, core principles to stop an epidemic. Okay. And it just goes down, it just goes back to a few, a few things that, that actually are pr pretty in intuitive. Okay. So so control measures are interventions designed to address control strategies. Always consider multiple perspectives, agent host, infectious sources, environment. Physical, social, economic, political. So not, not, okay. So what do we do? What's one way of, I'm gonna just go through three definitions. What's what way that we would reduce the contact rate? Well, you'll hear, you'll hear people talk about case isolation. Basically, people who are identified as a case that you believe to infect, this is infectious, is you isolate them. So you hear doctors talking about the patient is in respiratory isolation, okay? Isolate the case. Quarantine. People often confuse the word quarantine. Quarantine means, means restricting people who have been exposed, okay? Restrict them because they've been exposed and they may become a case. So usually you, you restrict them for a period of time 
until you're sure that they're not going to become a case. So that's what quarantine means. Oftentimes in the lay, in the lay press, people confuse case isolation and quarantine. Sheltering. Sheltering is where the person hasn't been exposed, and you decide, I'm just going to keep my kid home from school. I'm not even going to let my kid go to school so that they don't even get exposed. That's the example of sheltering. And the last one is social distancing. Social distancing is what you try to do is you try to reduce the density of people interacting when you don't really know what their status is. Okay, So mass gatherings, travel restrictions, cancellation of schools. Right, We don't really know the status of the people that are mingling, so we try to reduce that intermingling. So we call that social distancing. Okay, These are all examples of basically just trying to reduce the contact rate. Okay. <clears throat> Everybody okay? So basically you have you have you bas you really you have everything you need to investigate an outbreak in terms of concepts. Okay? So now we know we know how the car works. Now we can diagnose the problem and fix it. Okay? We covered mechanisms and we covered dynamics. Now I'm going to show you how we investigate outbreaks. Okay? And again, it's actually, most of this is common sense. OK. The first step I, I call, I use, I use a seven-step approach. I call this investigating an outbreak of seven steps or less. If you go to the CDC website, they give you 10 or 11 steps. This is, this is a little bit different. These are really seven conceptual steps. And you'll see why um, I do it this way. The first one is a case investigation. So what do you do? You start talking to the cases to look for commonalities. Look for commonalities, right? So you talk to the cases to look for commonalities. In August, we had, this is actually a big number for us. We had tw about 20, 20, 20 cases of E. coli O157 in San Francisco, in, in, in people that were associated with San Francisco, actually 22 that were associated with San Francisco. 22 cases. You know, we get less than 10 cases a year. We had all of a sudden, in a matter of a few days, that number of cases. We started talking to them, and pretty soon, one restaurant kept coming up over and over and over again. And but when you looked at geographically how the cases were spread, there didn't seem to be really any particular area, you know. And so, but in the, in just talking to the cases, just talking, this is what it's called hypothesis generating. You're talking to the cases, and you're trying to figure out what do you have in common. So they go a list, they go through a list of a list of uh, the usual sub suspects, and they ask them about where because we know we have an idea of the incubation period, so we have an idea when exposure may have occurred. So we start asking them. Think back, think back a few days, and where, you know, where did you eat? And so a restaurant kept coming over and over and over again. It became pretty obvious at that time that that restaurant was a source. I didn't have to do a fancy statistical test. Okay, It was obvious. I knew if we did do a statistical test, it would, it would be significant. That's the case investigation. So what we're trying to do is, in the case investigation, you're usually trying to do two things. You're trying to determine, is this an outbreak? And developing some pre preliminary hypothesis of what the cause of the outbreak is. Is it an outbreak and developing some preliminary hypothesis? You, you want it, if you have an agent, that helps. If you have an agent, that helps. But you want to be, you want to be, it's a, you, 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 want to be you, you want to be creative. The second step you actually usually don't find in most in most listings of, of outbreaks, although most people usually do it, but they don't. It's not in other people's uh, checklist. I call it the cause investigation, and that is thinking systematically in a very systematic, comprehensive way. What could be causing this outbreak? What did we learn from the case investigation that gives us a clue on what's causing this outbreak? And what does the literature tell us what might be causing this outbreak? So you do your homework. You go and find out what is the ecology. If you have an agent, what is the ecology of this? If it's a gyreal illness, what is the incubation period? You know. 
So you go to the cause investigation, you think about it, what could be causing this, but you attack it from multiple perspectives, not just the epidemiologic perspective, the laboratory perspective, the environmental perspective. You go in a very systematic way, do your homework. This is really, really critical. Because you need steps one and two, guess what, to do step three, to implement control measures, okay? If you don't get the first two steps down, you can't do the third step. You gotta do the first two steps. So that's what we, 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 we train people in that. Most other, most other classes, when they teach outbreak investigations, they focus on number four, how to conduct an analytic study. To me, you, when you're conducting the analytic studies because you haven't figured out what's going on or you haven't implemented control measures that are working, okay? So you don't go to an analytic study. You, the ideal situation is that you solve it in the first two steps, okay? You put your energy up front in the first two steps to solve it. Implement control measures using the stuff that we already talked about, understanding mechanisms and dynamics, those six, those six factors. If things aren't working, we do an analytic study, and I will show you a little bit about this is where the this is where the this is where the scientific method and hypothesis testing comes up. Drawing conclusions, drawing causal inference. I'm going to show you an example of where caus causal inference is drawing conclusions about what you believe is causing this. This is really, 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 really important because there's usually big implications when you're drawing causal conclusions. You might be shutting down a restaurant. You might be asking uh, uh, somebody to, to institute a recall, for example, okay? So causality is actually, we, we don't take it lightly. We wanna make sure, we wanna make sure that, you know, the evidence is, is, is pointing to Yes, we, we, we believe we figured out what's causing this and we need, to implement, we need to implement something. Continue surveillance and then communicate findings. Everybody, everybody okay so far? Alternative approach, you have that right there. So I already mentioned this, to confirm the outbreak and establish a preliminary causal hypothesis. The cause investigation systematically review known causal factors. I mentioned all of, the, I mentioned all of those. Oh, veterinary and vector-borne. Law enforcement slash forensics. This, this came up with when you're, you're, you're concerned about bioterrorism, that something may have been intentional. Prioritize likely causes to, to guide control measures. Generate testable hypothesis to conduct the analytic study if the cause remains unknown or control measures are not working. Control measures, you guys already know that. You guys, already, you guys are gonna be good. We're gonna, we're gonna sign you up to be a volunteer, so if anything happens, we can, you can come and help us. Containment using epidemiologic concepts, transmission mechanisms and dynamics, and organization of control measures. Step three. Step four, I'm gonna go ahead and skip that because we already covered that. Okay. I'm gonna go back to SARS for a second. Because people, people misunderstand what outbreak investigations are about. People usually think, they usually think about, okay, you're trying to identify the food item, right? That you're thinking. But it's much more than that. Because there are potentially a lot of unknowns, right? So think about when SARS happened. When SARS happened, we knew nothing about SARS. We didn't know the mode of transmission. We didn't know if it was droplet, contact, airborne. There was a lot of unknowns. And so the real, the real sort of brilliance of good outbreak investigations is asking a really good question that's important of public health significance and using a simple, elegant study to answer that question. A simple, elegant study to answer that question. Okay, <clears throat> so imagine when SARS happened. SARS happened back then. I already tell you how, import, how important this was. Okay, so here we had, we have a patient who's on an airplane to Beijing. Okay, and so we're gonna conduct, really quickly, we're gonna conduct an outbreak investigation from this airplane. Okay, so let's think about this. This person, by now we know it's a respiratory tract infection. We don't know the mode of transmission. It's, 
either droplet or airborne, or maybe both, but it's, you know, it's maybe one or the other. What are the implications to figuring this out? Huge, because if it's, air, if it's droplet, this droplet, I told you, face mask, hand wash, barrier protections. If it's airborne, now we're talking, we're talking about diluting air, filtering air, engineering mechanisms. So you're talking about, now it's much more, it costs many times more to interrupt airborne diseases. Okay, much more. So our, our study here is critical. We're gonna influence infection control practices around the world with this small outbreak investigation that we're about to do, okay? So you might think, okay, if this is droplet, if this is droplet, then the people who are close to this case are more likely to get infected than the people who are distanced from the case. If it's airborne, you would expect the probability of being infected if you're away is gonna be pretty similar to that being close, okay? So in, in, when you do an analytic study, the hallmark of an analytic study is having a comparison group, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have a comparison group. We're gonna say everybody, everybody that was sitting in this row and three rows in front, this is how they designed the study, we're gonna consider them exposed. We're gonna consider them the exposed. Everybody else, we're gonna consider non-exposed. So we can take the 23 people who were exposed, see how many of them developed SARS, take the 88 people who were unexposed, see how many of them developed SARS. If it was truly airborne, we would expect those proportions, statistical variation aside, we would expect those proportions to be close to equal. Okay, everybody understand that? Okay, let's do the experiment. So this is the experiment. Okay, the risk in the exposure group was eight over 23, and the risk in the unexposed group was 10 over 88. Remember I told you if they were equal, they were equal, the risk ratio, the risk ratio would be one, but instead, the risk ratio was three. So in other words, the risk in people who were sitting closer was three times more likely than those who were fitting farther away, okay? And this was statistically significant, which meaning that the chance of this happening, the, the probability of this happening by chance alone was about 2%. So it probably reflects reality, okay? So this is actually important. So this is one of the earlier, this is one of the earlier evidence that, that hard evidence showing us that this is really spread through respiratory droplets. Okay, everybody, everybody understand that? Okay, Whew. you guys just saved the world millions and millions of dollars, okay? And you probably saved a lot of lives, right? Because people took simple measures to protect themselves, okay? This is how knowledge is created. You know, earlier on I was telling you, you know, these diseases and, you know, I, I kind of I throw out these facts, but it's actually these simple, elegant studies that, that actually discover this knowledge. This was new knowledge at the time, okay? And it, it becomes the evidence base for doing, you can't do randomized control trials. You know, upstairs, or yeah, around here you can do randomized, you know, randomized control trials. You can't do randomized control trials. These are observational studies. You're using a scientific method to test hypothesis like this. So this is an example of an outbreak investigation. Okay, my, 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 any, anybody watch The Walking Dead? <laughs> Nobody watches The Walking Dead. Oh, wait, wait, somebody raise their hand. <laughs> my kids watch The Walking Dead. They're into, this, 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 this whole zombie thing going on. Okay, so. <clears throat> anyway, so I, I said, but, but one of the, the disaster, one of the CDC, um, workers who's in charge of disasters. One day, just for a joke, just for a joke, he came up with a theme of, of teaching public health preparedness using zombies. <laughs> and it, every, it, was just, it was so funny that it just caught on that they, they then developed this whole campaign around zombies. Okay. <clears throat> so we're gonna go through a few outbreaks. We're gonna go through a few outbreaks. And so now you'll, you have an understanding of the concepts that we're thinking about and, and then each one of these will bring up some interesting, interesting twist that, that, that you might find interesting. 
So this is an outbreak, and all of these, all of these involve cases in San Francisco. Fusar the outbreak of Fusarium uh, keratitis in San Francisco. And I, I picked published studies. <clears throat> So on February 23rd, 2006, from March 30th, 2006, four cases of culture-proven Fusarium keratitis were seen here at UCSF at the Proctor Foundation Corneal Service. All patients used soft contact lenses on a daily wear basis. Three of the four cases occurred in, in young, otherwise healthy uh, female soft contact lens users. All three of these patients used Brand X purchased in the San Francisco Bay Area. The fourth case occurred in a 56-year-old female undergoing chemotherapy. She also used Brand X. <clears throat> four, four cases. Well, what if, what if, what if every year there were, hundreds of, there were hundreds of cases, right? You would say, oh, well, four cases, this is not much more than baseline. But it turned out that when they back, went back, they had seen maybe a total of eight cases in the past 30 years. So all of a sudden, even a small number of cases is an outbreak because it's more than you would expect for that time and place, okay? More than you would expect for that time and place. And it looks like they have a hypothesis here. They have a hypothesis that maybe it's Brand X. Maybe it's Brand X. One of the problems is, is that maybe, maybe Brand X is super popular, right? It's so popular that we, by chance alone, all four of them are gonna be using Brand X because it's so popular. Okay, this is where a comparison group is really important. But what's the problem? This is a really small number. So now, now we're getting to the issue of how do I test the scientific hypothesis when I don't have a sufficient statistical power to test the hypothesis? Okay, and this happens all the time. This is really a real challenge. In this case, unfortunately, unfortunately in this case, it turned out to be part of a global outbreak. Okay, it turned out to be part of a global outbreak. So when we now look at the case, this is now the same, this is now the cases in Hong Kong. <clears throat> this is a little bit different, this is a little bit different. In this one, we, did, we do what's called a case control study, a case control study. In the previous one, we did what's called a cohort study. Here we're doing a case control study. We're taking cases and we're comparing them to controls. Okay, out of the cases, what are the proportion that used Brand X? Out of the controls, people who did not have this keratitis, what is the proportion that used Brand X? Okay, so what do you see? A big proportion used Brand X. Okay, so it, 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 and what we end up, we end up calculating what are called odds. Odds is a different way of formulating risk. But the point, the point is, is that the odds ratio is very high. If there was no association, it would be around one, okay? Very high and highly statistically significant. This is unlikely to be due to chance, random error, okay? So brand X was recalled. <clears throat> and, but it started, it started, it didn't start in San Francisco, but there were cases that were recognized in San Francisco. Oh, I, I wanna mention, um, when, in, in these cases, you'll see this number up here. This stands for PubMed ID. If you go to PubMed.org, you can put in the number and you can actually read, you can read at, le at least read the abstract, if not the article. Okay. Nosocomial outbreak of streptococcal infections associated with asymptomatic healthcare workers in California. So this was an, out this is an outbreak that occurred that I was in, in, involved in. Early on, early on in my career. During December 23rd from 1996 to January 1st, 1997, three patients who had surgery at Hospital B developed streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. Okay, so uh, group A streptococcus is a bacteria that usually it causes not just, people will talk about strep throat, it can cause a pharyngitis, but it can also cause soft tissue infections. And sometimes when you get a soft tissue infection, you can get a toxin that's released that puts you into shock, okay? Puts you, your blood pressure just drops, you have, uh, your, your organs don't get enough blood and you can die, okay? Um, so let me go ahead and, and go, through, go through this. 
three patients who had uh, surgery at Hospital B develop streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. On December 23rd, a previously healthy 28-year-old woman underwent a parathyroidectomy performed by Surgeon A. The day before surgery, Surgeon B performed direct laryngoscopy on the patient. She developed chest pain and hypotension on December 24th, the next day. On December 26th, she was transferred to the ICU because of respiratory distress, then developed cardiopulmonary arrest. Cultures taken on December 25th from the neck wound and pleural fluids grew, grew, grew group A streptococcus. She went into shock and developed renal failure, coagulopathy, purpura, and died on December 29th. So think about this. This was an otherwise completely healthy 28-year-old woman at that time. On December 30th, a previously healthy 56-year-old woman underwent a subtotal thyroidectomy performed by Surgeon A. With the assistance of Surgeon B, she was discharged December 31st. Later that day, she was found dead in her home. Postmortem cultures of blood and tissue grew, grew group A streptococcus. The cause of death was attributed to septicemia and group A streptococcus. So it's these kind of cases, as an ID fellow, when I was, it's these kind of cases that give you a huge respect for infectious diseases. The, you know, people can get sick really, really fast. People who are otherwise completely healthy. <clears throat> on December 30th, this is now all around Christmas time. On December 30th, a previously healthy 50-year-old, 57-year-old woman underwent a subtotal thyroidectomy performed by Surgeon A, with Surgeon B assisting. The next day, she was discharged. On January 1st, 1997, she sought care at the emergency department and was admitted to the ICU in shock with acidosis, respiratory failure, renal impairment, and bilateral pleural effusions. Cultures from the surgical wound, pleural fluid, and blood grew group A streptococcus. After a hospital course including sepsis, global myocardial hypokinesis, and lower gastrointestinal bleeding, she was discharged on February 4th. So she survived. So two out of three patients died from streptococcal. These are people who were otherwise healthy. For those who know a little bit about medicine, usually surgery in the neck, in the thyroid region, is considered very safe surgery. Everything is right there. It's very clean. It's the kind of thing that, you know, nothing should really go wrong with, with patients that come in with that kind of surgery. Everything, you don't expect anything like this to happen, OK? Um, so if we, were, if, if we were doing an outbreak investigations course, we'd probably spend the next couple of hours <laughs> actually talking about how, you, how would you investigate this? How would you investigate this? This is, this is a really difficult one to investigate, OK? You can, you can begin to have some clues. You look at some commonalities. Surgeon A seems to be a common point. But maybe Surgeon A was the only person who did that kind of surgery. Were there other cases that appeared, other cases that appeared in other parts of the hospital in other times? This was called case finding. Here we, even though we're aware of these three cases, maybe this has been going on for a while. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe there had been other, other examples of group A streptococcal severe infections that have been occurring, and we, and we need to actually see, is this problem bigger than what we're, what we're seeing right now? This may be the tip of the iceberg of a, bi of a bigger problem. So we go into what's called case finding. We start looking at microbiological records. If we have surveillance systems, we look at surveillance systems. We develop a case definition as a way to begin to try to find new cases. Some of the challenges with this is that the number, it turns out that we didn't find anything. The number of cases are really small. It's really hard to test any hypothesis the way we did before, you know, when you have a lot of cases. Very difficult. The other thing that you begin to ask is, so, and, and, and then the other, the other challenge with a case investigation is two of our patients are dead. So I, we, can't at, we can't get, and we, you know, we, we, you know we, we did everything we could. We spoke to families. We tried to figure out, you know, what was, who brought it in, what we thought of all different things that may have, may have happened. These, these hospital, these hospital uh, outbreaks, very challenging because patients get exposed to many things, many things from the time they roll into the admission office and they're upstairs and they're being moved around. You have all kinds of staff that are coming in that are cleaning, all kinds. Remember, they, the person had a laryngoscopy. They also had a sonogram. They had all kinds of things that we looked at. 
Very, very hard to sort of tease that out. The other thing that becomes important is, what do we know about group A streptococcus? This is where we actually go back to what we learned in the very beginning. What is the reservoir of group A streptococcus? Turns out the reservoir are humans. It doesn't survive long in the environment. It's really humans are the reservoir. So that means that we have to start looking what human person could have exposed this person, could have exposed these patients. We know it causes pharyngitis, so somebody could have been carrying it in the throat. Okay. Um, so these are all the things that we were, we were thinking about. Part of our cause investigation was also going into the literature. It turns out that this is rare. This doesn't happen often. But when you look at the literature, the CDC is a really good source. It turns out that when you look at nationally, you have enough experience with this kind of, they call it a nosocomial outbreak inside a, inside a hospital. You have enough experience with these types of hospital outbreaks that you could go back and say, what did they learn from the previous outbreaks? One of the things we learned from previous outbreaks is that people can be colonized, not just in the pharynx, but also in the rectum, okay? They can be colonized down there, okay? So they learn this from these other outbreaks. So people can be completely, have no symptoms. They can be colonized out there. Then the other question, I know you guys are asking this, what is the mode of transmission, right? So when it, it's, in, it's in the pharynx, you say, well, droplets, right? But if it's down here, how did it get down, how did it, how did it get to somebody else? Anybody want to take a guess? Pilot. What? Passing. The, the technical term is passing gas, right? <laughs> so we want to, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we, this is something, you know, uh, that's, there is another, there's a more technical term, but that's the one we'll use, okay? <laughs> but the point is, the point is it turns out that when we started looking at the literature, it turned out that you can have asymptomatic carriers of group A streptococcus who are colonized in the rectum, and it looks, and they've actually done experiments that you, they, they've actually were able to find a carrier, an asymptomatic carrier, who had the outbreak strain to the other person and had no face-to-face -face exposure. They were in a completely separate rooms, and they transmitted from one person to the other person. And the only logical explanation was passing of gas, so that it became aerosolized and got to the other person. Okay, so we wouldn't have known, I would not have known that if we had not done our homework. Okay, and actually the last part of homework, of doing your homework is causing that, calling national experts and saying, you know, tell us what you know. <laughs> so we also did that. We called, we called CDC, we, we got sort of, you know, we also got, got their input. So this is an interesting outbreak because it sort of brings in, it really sort of brings in the importance of the cause investigation because there is no, ability to do such scientific hypothesis testing, but really the cause investigation, understanding the, the ecology of, of the bacterium, and really understanding from other outbreaks how this outbreak may have occurred. It turns out what we did was is that we shut down the OR, we cultured everybody that could have had contact with these patients, everybody. And we cultured every orifice, every orifice that might have group A streptococcus, we only found one person that was colonized with group A streptococcus, but, and it was in the pharynx, but they did not have the outbreak strain. So we never figured out exactly what happened. Okay. But eventually, um, they, they reinstituted uh, surgery, and they actually started giving um, pre-surgical antibiotics because of this. Normally, they didn't because, I, as I mentioned before, very clean surgery. So this brought up some, some, just some interesting things that we, that the reason why those steps are, are really important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to just, um, uh, I'll, this one will be really quick. This will be really quick because there's not a lot, this is a little bit different. This is, this is so, this is uh, from June through December 2000. This was in a, in a matter of a few months, all of a sudden we saw 230 cases of Shigella infection occurring in San Francisco. All of a sudden my disease control investigator is saying, boy, we're seeing a lot of Shigella. Shigella causes a, a severe diarrhea. Humans, humans are, the, are the only host. We're, um, we're the reservoir. Very infectious, very infectious. So this is, the out, this is the outbreak curve over that summer. Most of them are men. Most of them are men. 
okay? And as, as and we started doing the descriptive epidemiology, so this is now an outbreak in the community, start doing the descriptive epidemiology, you'll see that most of them are white men. Most of them are white men, okay? And we actually collect sexual orientation as part of our routine um, case investigations for any, anybody that has a reportable disease that, that's significant like Shigella. And most of them were men who had sex with men. So this was really primarily an outbreak that was having, happening in the men who have sex, men who have, men who have sex with men community, or MSM. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about this outbreak, this was really the ecology of Shigella changing. A different strain of Shigella commonly occurred in men who have sex with men, but it would actually make them more sick. This strain of Shigella is actually a milder form of Shigella, and it turned out to, it turned out to be really a global, global outbreaks. In cities across the world, we were seeing this. We just happened to notice it in San Francisco, but it was happening all over the world. There was a shift in the microbiology of, of Shigella in that population something that was more mild. Well, what happens when something's more mild? You don't stay home, you stay active. Does that make sense? It's one of the principles about infectious diseases. The sicker it makes you, ironically, the less infectious you are because usually you're too sick to go out and infect people, okay? And then the last one I'm gonna show you really quick. This one, I'm just gonna just run. This is the, 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 last, the last one I'm gonna show you. Back in the 90s, when, when, with the AIDS epidemic and patients becoming severely immune suppressed, cryptosporidiosis, we had a, a lot of cryptosporidiosis, caused a debilitating, incurable diarrhea in patients with advanced HIV disease. San Francisco has mostly unfiltered tap water. There was concern that people who were drinking tap water it was a cause of their it was a cause of their cryptosporidiosis. I went into this knowing from the, the previous study. I'm thinking, eh, it's not the tap water. It's just sexual transmission. We know we know that men who have sex with men have enteric infections. It's just that. So this is an example where I have a hypothesis. I have a bias on what I expect to find. So we did it. We did a case control study comparing comparing those who had the lowest exposure to tap water. These are people who said they never drank tap water at home or outside the home, and those who always drank tap water at home or outside the home. You can see that the odds ratios were huge, huge, okay? Shocked me, okay? I did not ex ex expect this at all. Why is this important? Well, this is important because it turns out to change San Francisco to filter tap water would cost hundreds of millions of dollars huge financial implications for this. Okay, so we were the first people in the country to, to, to find this. But one of the, one of the, what happened was is that in the mid-1990s to the late 1990s, cryptosporidium disappeared. Why? I just told you it was one of the most debilitating infections, opportunistic infections in HIV, but it disappeared. And the doctors know this. <laughs> Antiretroviral therapy, antiretroviral therapy, so medicine. So it turned out that, skip that, by eliminating, if you look over here, by eliminating, eliminating immunosuppression, you basically got rid of that cause. So this is an important principle, and that is people were saying, filter the tap water it was much cheaper to provide medical care. Much cheaper to provide medical care. By providing medical care, you raise, you, raise, you made their immune system. Somebody asked a question about immune system. You raise their immune system. The opportunistic infections disappeared. Not just cryptosporidiosis, virtually all of them disappeared. Much cheaper. Okay, so that's it. I wanted to go through that. I have five minutes to ask, to answer questions. And then I will stay afterwards to answer any more questions. Any, any? So I took you through quite a bit of material. Yeah, I think I read Scientific American uh, a time ago about herd immunity. Mm -hmm. And what actually, I think they have to do with the uh, prevention of serious, like the 19, 1917 
So herd, herd immunity is a collective immunity that a population enjoys, okay? But it, 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 we, we, we benefit, we enjoy that immunity from the people who have been immunized, usually through, usually through vaccination. So what happens is, is that, so for example, if I, if I get vaccinated and I'm immune, I'm protected, but I also protect you, right? So you have this indirect protection because I've, because I've vaccinated myself. So collectively, you and I are a herd. You and, we have this herd immunity. And it turned that herd immunity benefits not just the people who did not get vaccinated like yourself, but it even benefits the people who got vaccinated because not all vaccines are 100%. So that's why it's called the collective immunity of a community from people who are immune. So that's what, that's what it is. And that's part of the interesting thing about infectious diseases. It's a population phenomenon. When you had two patients in separated rooms, who later discovered had separate locations of the strep problem. Did you discover that because you were testing everybody and every orifice? Yeah, so for, for the, yeah, the, 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 the example that I brought up of two, two patients, a, a source, a source and somebody, that was from the literature. We learned that from, investi from reading about other outbreaks. So we learned from other outbreaks where they were able to identify the, per, the the carrier and where they were they where it came from. They so, actually found it in your case. No, we didn't. We found we found we found of everybody we tested over 70 people. We found one we found one person who had it. They had it in their pharynx, but it wasn't the outbreak strain. It wasn't the, so it wasn't the cause of the outbreak. So we never we never figured out how it how it happened. Where we never figured out what the human source, but knowing a little, knowing how to do the cause investigation, gave us an idea of where to look for the usual suspects. One more mm -hmm. Do you get a pushback from people who don't want to be tested, like when you tested all the healthcare workers? Do you ever get pushback saying, "No, I don't want you to test me," you know, because like we're dealing with AIDS. People like, like mm -hmm. now, I don't think that you can mandatorily test. Well, yeah. So in the well, yes. Yeah, so that's a little testing for HIV is a little little bit different. But for in in the case of the outbreak, we were testing for the group A streptococcus, um, and no, everybody completely participated. You know, everybody completely because they, they're healthcare workers and every everybody, you know, to have to have what happened in this in this. Um, in this hospital, it was it was devastating to have two out of three very he otherwise healthy people, and everybody was committed to get to the bottom of this. And so we worked with employee health, and everybody was very people are usually very cooperative, especially in with with something like this. Usually not a problem. Okay, thank you.